We have already um, reached the appointed time and we have already formed a quorum. I'd like to call the meeting to order. Let's uh, invite the administration team to join us later. First of all, information papers issued since the last meeting. No information paper has been issued since the last meeting. Second, yes, let's invite the administration team to join us. Item two. Items for discussion at the next meeting. We have got two papers for members to refer to. Date of next meeting, 20th of uh, April, Monday, 10.45. Two items for discussion. Yes, welcome, Ms. Uh, uh, Bureau Director. First, uh, mechanism for conducting a great structure review. Second, use of agency workers. In fact, uh, at the panel meeting held on the 9th of October, Mr. Lee Chuck Yen already requested the administration to conduct a review to separate government lifeguards from the artisan grade. And uh, Mr. Wong Kwok Heng also wrote to the panel requesting the panel to discuss the manpower situation, remuneration, and the request for a great structure review of government lifeguards. And uh, at past uh, panel meetings, Mrs. Regina Yip has also asked that uh, the discipline services be subject to a great structure review. So we'll be discussing the issue at the next meeting. So if there is no objection, then we'll have the two um, items uh, for the next uh, meeting. Item three. Civil service related issues featuring in the 2015-2016 budget. Um, a paper has been issued to members. So can I invite the Bureau Director to walk us through the paper? Thank you, Chairman. Let me briefly go through the um, salient points of the paper. First, um, on civil service establishment in 2015-16, in the government's budget, we have expected um, that uh, there will be 2,450 new posts um, to be added to the civil service uh, establishment. So there's, there will be an increase by about 1.5% uh, when compared to 2014-15, and that's about the same rate of increase uh, when compared to 2014-15 as to the bureaus and departments, which will see this uh, increase that, that has been included um, in the enclosure. As you can see, in most of the departments and um, departments, there will be an increase in the establishment in order to help the bureaus and the departments to um, implement uh, new policies and also to improve their services. For example, the uh, low-income uh, uh, families' um, subsist uh, allowance and also the commissioning of the new facilities and so on. We fully, uh, we fully understand that with regard to the um, workload and pressure on the civil service, it has been increasing. That's why we believe that uh, different bureaus and departments will need additional manpower in order to implement new measures and improve their existing services. And of course, we would also like to encourage the bureaus and departments to adopt other measures in order to reduce the stress on uh, civil servants, including streamlining of existing work procedures and some of the uh, uh, processes and work can also be automated. And uh, we are also stepping up training and uh, uh, further uh, workshops. So we'll be um, increasing the number of uh, short-term internship places uh, by about uh, 3,000. When compared to last year, there will be an increase of about 30%. We hope that more young people will gain working experience and have a deeper understanding of different areas of work in the government. And the increase will cost about $21 million. Under the program, about 50 bureaus and departments involving um, in public health care, labor and social services, engineering projects, survey and statistics, etc., will offer internship places to young people, mainly from tertiary institutions during summer or other times of the year. Bureaus and departments will also determine the duties of their interns and conduct their own recruitment exercises. On the other hand, Concerning medical and dental services for civil service, I'll be uh, talking about that in detail later. But then, as we can see in the 2015-16 draft estimates of expenditure, about uh, uh, 1.5 1, 
uh, two, three, two, four million dollars, a uh, billion dollars have been set aside. That's for the continuation of uh, in improvement of services, and that would include uh, the increase in um, general outpatient services, um, opening of uh, new family clinics, and also dental clinics, and so on. And that has also uh, gone up by some 12.6 percent when compared to last year. With regard to the provision for reimbursement for medical expenses incurred, that has also been uh, revised uh, by 14.4 percent. And in 2015-16, we will also be increasing the number of dental surgeries. And also, there will also be a new uh, uh, families clinic in Fanning. And also for pension payment, in 2015-16, we expect that uh, to uh, be at uh, about uh, $28.577 uh, billion, which represents um, an increase of uh, uh, $2.939 billion an increase by 11.7 percent. That's because of the increase in the number of new retirees. So that's all for my presentation. And we'll be happy to take members' questions. As usual, five minutes for both questions and answers. We have two members who have raised their hands. First, Li Chek Yan, and then next, Bill Tang. First, Li Chek Yan. Thank you, Chairman. I'd like to discuss with the Bureau Director about the establishment for the civil service because all along civil servants have been complaining that our workload has been rising and yet in terms of work uh, in terms of manpower there has been no increase whatsoever and in some cases there has been a reduction because of some redeployment that's why work pressure and also workload have been totally ignored by the administration and of course the administration will definitely uh, tell me that uh, all right let's well just take a look. We have increased that by 1.5 percent. And if you can take a look at the annex, actually, uh, it's also widely distributed in different bureaus and departments. But then, when I look into that uh, deeper, in fact, uh, there is an increase by some 2,540 posts. But that that would not um, help the civil servants at all, because if you look at the 2,500 plus posts, uh, well, uh, some of that uh, would be. Uh, uh, most of that uh, would be to take care of the low income group. Well, of course, uh, you're not able to take care of uh, the existing uh, incumbents. But then you can say that uh, uh, there would be no additional uh, pressure on them. And also, if you look at another figure, 600 uh, NCSC posts will be converted uh, to civil service uh, posts. And of course, uh, we would welcome that. We've been, we've been fighting for that because uh, the NCSC staff should be converted to uh, pensionable or uh, permanent established at permanent post, but then I don't know if the administration will review that uh, there is that is uh, there has been no through train arrangement whatsoever. In the past, uh, you have never been willing to offer any uh, through train conversion for them to change from NCSC status to permanent establishment status. I think you are actually short changing them. So for the 600 plus, uh, they are NCSC staff. So uh, that would add up to about a uh, thousand. So on only uh, 1,450 posts uh, will be increased. So the uh, biggest winner will, the, will be the police force. There has been there will be an increase by some 600 posts. So if everybody is able to enjoy the same increase, then the number would be a lot more significant. But then only the police have been able to uh, see such a significant increase. And obviously, that's a political decision. And I'm not going to argue with you about uh, whether it's right to make that political decision. But then politically, you think that uh, the police force deserve this increase. But then for other departments and bureaus, you're just uh, increasing the number by a handful. And then for the police, uh, you've increased that by 600. So why not for the others? Is it that all along you're trying to suppress the um, civil service establishment, and uh, on this occasion you try to increase it by, by 1.5 percent? All right, given the fact that the police have seen this significant increase, and if you look at the 600 to be added to the police force, and then for the 400 plus, they are newly added uh, for the uh, low income families, then only about 900 will go to the other departments, and you've also got to. Uh, uh, count in the number of uh, NCSC posts. Well, I'd like to make a few responses. First of all, as I've explained, increasing the manpower is to deal with uh, new services and also to improve the existing services. And of course, some departments, for example, would see more automation and uh, there would also be streamlining of uh, procedures and so on. And um, some of the resources will also have to be de redeployed. 
And after the proposal has been made, and if we think that uh, their demand is justified, then of course we'll see how that can be increased. And of course for the 1.5 percent increase in manpower, and if you look at uh, the past few years, that has been a new high. And last year, it was also increased by 1.5 percent. That's why during the past few years, this is a relatively high rate of increase. But then we also understand that uh, by increasing manpower, we also have to ensure, as I said, the departments will also have to um, think about it very carefully so that uh, the civil service establishment would not be expanding excessively because we understand that we are using public money. And there is one point that I'd, I'd like to clarify. Well, uh, increasing the manpower for a particular department has nothing to do with political consideration. We have to look at their work demand and whether they have alternative ways of uh, dealing with that problem before we make a decision to increase the manpower. And also on increasing manpower, 1.5 percent is not a low rate. In fact, that would involve some 2,000 plus posts. And we have also not kept the increase. And for the past few years, we've been looking at the uh, resources available. And also, we have looked at the different departments and bureaus' demand and the figures that they have submitted before we made a decision. And also for NCSC staff, as I've explained, for fairness and uh, openness, we would conduct open recruitment. And of course, we also uh, encourage the NCSC staff to apply for these civil service posts, but then they will have to do so on a fair and open basis. And according to our experience, because of their experience, actually, they do have an edge over the other uh, applicants. All right, Mr. Bill Tang. Thank you, Chairman. As we can see, well, there will be some 2,540 uh, civil service uh, posts. And the paper also says that about 600 will be replacing the NCSC staff. And of course, the FTU would like to say that we welcome that very much. And of course, um, in previous papers, you have said that uh, some 2,960 NCSC staff still remain. And then up until, the, uh, up until June 2014, about uh, 2,330 have been replaced. So only about uh, 625 posts remain. And you said that about 600 will be converted to the civil service establishment. So does that mean that all of them have been absorbed into the civil service? That's the first question. And of course, you have to move with time, whether in terms of your services and also the uh, terms of employment. So in the past, uh, you promised that uh, you would try as far as possible to absorb them. And uh, by 2006, you said that uh, a study would be conducted. And it was confirmed that uh, there, were, there were a total of 4,000. And then you would try to convert them to the uh, civil service establishment gradually. So when are you going to conduct another review to s find out the latest situation? Because uh, you have tried to clear that uh, backlog. But then it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, the departments would be converting all of their NCSC staff to the permanent establishment. So can you answer the two questions? There are two points. For the first point, I'll invite Mr. Chen to respond. But then on um, principles, basically the policy is that well, all the departments are aware of that. If they need um, civil servants in the long term, then they will have to convert the NCSC post to a civil service establishment. So it's not like what we did in the past few years in the form of a major review. Actually, it's done on a progressive and uh, persistent manner. That is, uh, the department will have to tell us exactly how many posts they would need uh, in the civil service establishment and so on. And therefore, every year we'll be giving you an account on the latest position. So in simple terms, all the departments are required to do that. And if they have to create new NCSC posts, they would also have to get our approval. And if they have to increase that number beyond the cap, because in simple terms over the years we've been telling the departments to follow up on this instead of just uh, doing this once and then wait until another review. And that has to be done on an ongoing basis. So uh, these would be the other positions that we have already uh, taken away. Perhaps Mr. Chan will talk about the few thousand positions. Uh, the 600 posts that we have mentioned in the paper is newly added. And we have already told the panel before that there are some 7,000 plus posts which we have confirmed that will have long-term needs for 
being there, and therefore we will need civil service uh, members of the civil service to fill those those posts, and that is the situation now. I would just want to clarify the point. We do not see that there is a regular monitoring for the LegCo. For example, will you be telling us that for 12,000 and CSC position posts that you have, uh, do you have a target as to, let's say, when you will put them or absorb them into the permanent establishment within the civil service? Well, uh, Mr. Chair, every year we will come back to the panel to give an estimate as to how many of these posts will be turned into permanent establishment posts. But you will have to understand that for the different departments, uh, there are a few conditions that we set out for them as to NCSC staff. First of all, that the positions will have to be either seasonal or the number of hours do not uh, add up to permanent posts or whether there are some short-term uh, needs for the positions, etc. And uh, so this is not a target with a hard and fast number, but rather the criterion is the nature of work. But of course, the department, department on receiving the resources, they will not get that automatically every year. They will have to apply before we can provide them with the resources. Now, there are certain posts which are uh, long-term that, that is to say long established because of the number of hours of work and the nature of work, uh, they are in any case still NCSC positions. Now, I am worried. So you are saying that without this overall comprehensive review, there will be long-term NCSC uh, positions. Yes, you'll have to wait for the next round. Mr. Wong Kwok Hing now, please. Uh, Mr. Chair, I welcome the government in the f new financial year to provide the 600 posts as um, permanent positions in the establishment. I welcome that because the Labour members of the LegCo in uh, 2004 to 2006 in uh, Baptist University um, Assembly Hall, uh, the CE, well, at the time, Mr. Zhang had committed to the Labour um, members present that this will come to pass. And I am very happy that indeed it is reality now. I'm, I welcome the number as I see it here. Now, in civil service work, there are situations which the same kind of work would fetch different uh, pay, and that is still persisting. I'm not going to pursue the actual numbers now, but rather I would like to put the following question to the Secretary, and that is, are there certain departments, for example, uh, such as the post office, which will be reviewed um, soon? There will be, there is an operating fund for the operation of the post office and among the various, various departments or various funds, the post office is the about, is about the only one, the, that is, uh, loss making among these trading funds. And therefore the staff are worried that, uh, they, and they feel insecure about their positions and their work. And of course, uh, there are differential uh, pay to the same type of work. And also, they, there is uh, worry that their positions may not be uh, kept. Now, I'm asking whether we can consider um, Re-establishing these staff as permanent establishment civil servants rather than to go under the fund. Now, uh, because I have just arrived from another meeting, I do not know whether, whether this question had been raised before. Um, and I ask the following question, and that is the public libraries. 
The staff of the public libraries are now employed by headhunters and or the employment uh, companies, and these employment companies actually get a cut uh, from the government. And these are long-term posts, but you, the government nevertheless allow for a middleman and getting a cut from the uh, proceeds. I just want to know whether that this kind of uh, unfair and unnecessary situation need to be reviewed. Uh, Mr. Wong had raised two questions. First of all, concerning the trading fund. We have talked about that a few times, actually, in this meeting. I understand your views on this, but um, for the trading fund overall, Design and operation of the trading fund is not for my department. The relevant department will have to look into this. And under this operation of the fund, it is not true that positions cannot be added. In fact, they can be added. But the under the trading fund operation, Everything has to be more stringent, and they have to balance their own books, and therefore there may be uh, contract staff, as the NCSC staff. But even so, the operation, the service, and also the finances will have to be acceptable, and uh, the salaries will also have to be reasonable for all staff concerned. Now, as for differential payment between uh, permanent staff or civil servants and NCSC, um, perhaps there are different work undertaken by the uh, staff, and this is not something that's unique under the trading fund. Now, as for the Culture and Leisure Department, I do not know about the specifics, but in the next meeting of ours, when we discuss intermediary companies or agencies. In fact, these companies provide the manpower to the relevant departments. These are only for short-term positions, that is, nine months positions or around that. So these are not for permanent positions. Well, I would want the Secretary to bring this back to the uh, higher echelons of the government concerning the trading funds. Yes, uh, I have a question, and then Lee Chuck Yan will ask his question. Uh, Mr. Secretary, can you perhaps please refer to the appendix concerning the change in establishment? The medical and health, 132, uh, 139 positions are taken off. Are these medical doctors, or what posts are they? Now, these are actually shadow posts, and that is to say those who have chosen to stay in the Department of Health, but uh, some of them have actually retired and, take, uh, and left the department, and therefore we can take these positions out. Are they all medical doctors? Well, of different uh, positions and nature of work. Next, Mr. Lee Kwok Wei. Well, in fact, the workload for the civil service is very heavy, and for this 1.5 percent addition, it actually is not sufficient to cover the additional work because workload has increased by over 1.5 percent. The number, of course, is still insufficient. And there is a situation which we see, and that is the uh, non-civil service contracts and also outsourcing is still very much a reality. And it was mentioned just now for the 2006 survey for NCSE transfer into permanent positions. It seemed that the situation had been resolved to a certain extent, but that was in 2006 a survey. <coughs> We, are, we still have over 10,000 NCSC posts, and it's been almost eight years now. What is the plan for these 10,000 posts? Will there be another assessment? Will there be consideration as to how many of them can be 
uh, transfer to permanent establishment. Secondly, on outsourcing, Mr. Wong Kwok Heng had uh, spoken to that. That is to say, apart from the culture and leisure department assistant library um, positions, they are actually they are actually not just nine months post, but it's nine months and another nine months and another nine months. Of course, in the long term, we would want them to become permanent establishment posts. But at the same time, I would want to talk about the outsourcing arrangement. It is far from satisfactory. So let's say for the case that we have just talked about now, the library, for the library assistants, uh, the outsourced company had not paid up the salaries and this is uh, highly unsatisfactory and unfair. In 43C of the employment ordinance, uh, the for construction industry, the main contractor can come up with the funds first for salaries payment, but not so for the NCSC outsourcing or government outsourced uh, companies or contracts arrangement. My question is whether for these outsource arrangements, can you also provide some kind of safeguards for the staff coming under these outsource uh, situations where there is non-payment of uh, salary so that the relevant department can pay up in advance to these uh, staff rather than to have them uh, go through lengthy legal processes or go without salaries. In fact, they are already in very uh, difficult uh, situations already in keeping their livelihood. Perhaps. Can we provide some more safeguard for these workers? Mr. Chair, I would like to respond to the questions uh, just now. First of all, on contract staff in NCSC positions, as I have already explained, and as Mr. Chan had mentioned just now, these 600 posts are not the posts that we have uh, talked about in the past. So every year we will be reviewing these and uh, taking action. So we will be doing that on a continual basis, on, a, on an annual basis. And therefore, the transfer into permanent positions or permanent established positions had exceeded what we have uh, reported in the past. But you will have to understand that this takes time because for there to be permanent established positions uh, newly opened, it will take time. And also there may be certain staff under NCSC who are are still under certain contracts, engaged in certain projects which are still ongoing, uh, and so those will have to wait as well. So as I mentioned just now, this is on an ongoing basis and on an annual basis. So that's by way of explanation. Secondly, concerning positions which are of short-term need or perhaps the nature of work is not does not come under any permanent establishment positions scope of work or seasonality etc so there may be a necessity for these contract staff as the ncsc staff but we want long term uh, work to be taken up by permanent establishment positioned staff uh, Ms. Emily Love, of course I support the government in being cautious in spending public money and not um, growing the establishment um, willfully. But I also know that uh, certain departments are really under great pressure. And these departments will have to come to you for a applications. It is not you who uh, put additional positions to them. And sometimes when they even come for application, you may turn them down. Uh, there are certain uh, situations, such as for social welfare, I hear that uh, they complain that the workload's been too high. And now, for... Well, um, you're going to regulate the guest houses and so on. So I've talked to the trade, and uh, they said that uh, you weren't even willing to have meetings with them. But then a lot needs to be done. 
And then for many years, you have never conducted any inspection. You have done nothing at all. And then for the immigration department and the CNE department, of course, at the border checkpoint, uh, they are actually having a very hard time. They are hard pressed. And uh, election is coming up in November. And um, those staff would not be needed on a long-term basis. But then during that period of time, you would need some extra hands. And uh, according to the bureaus and, and so on, well, they said that they had difficulty recruiting people. So is it that uh, you're going to uh, recruit uh, the retirees from the civil service so that they would have uh, enough manpower to uh, conduct the election in a very smooth manner? I think that's very important. So uh, do you have anything that uh, – is there anything that you can do to help them? Thank you, Ms. Lau. Well, for the two points that you just mentioned, well, let me explain about the mechanism. The mechanism is that uh, every year the departments and the bureaus will have to uh, submit uh, their bids to a bureau as to how many uh, staff they'd like to add. And of course, we will have to conduct a very careful um, scrutiny of their application and the two uh, uh, top uh, officials will have to make a decision. So um, the power rests with the department. They can submit their bids, and then will scrutinize their bids, mm. whether or not they can uh, redeploy their staff, and also whether the uh, work processes can be streamlined and so on. So basically, we understand their situation, but then I'm sure you would also understand that uh, it's not that uh, whenever they have um, any bids, uh, we will approve. Even though we know that there has been an increase in their workload, we also have to do our job in order to make sure that uh, the establishment is reasonable, it's not expanding excessively. And also for the uh, Electoral Affairs Office, yes, um, they have already increased their manpower rather significantly because originally uh, their manpower is not that big. And the Immigration Department has also seen a significant increase. And over the past few years, they have been doing the same, in particular where there is a new uh, border checkpoint opening. As regards uh, some um, um, temporary jobs, or time-limited posts or seasonal in nature, we do encourage the, the departments. There are two approaches. Either they can uh, recruit some contract staff, and we've also got a new system in place, and we would also encourage them to um, re-employ some uh, retirees. So uh, I understand that some departments are considering that um, actively because uh, they do need some people with civil service experience, and they understand that uh, they are encouraged to do so. But then. Um, are there situations whereby you would reject the bids from the departments? Yes, definitely. Can you tell us uh, exactly the numbers? Well, in terms of the numbers, we also have to be very careful about this. But then how about the um, Home Affairs uh, Department? You know that uh, they have so limited man manpower, so they, they don't even bother to uh, make the request, and uh, they couldn't care less. Is that the case? I'm not very fam familiar with the situation concerning the regulation of guest houses um, uh, that would be uh, under the new regulatory regime. But then, as I said, if there is any new initiative or new policy or new law coming into play, and if they were to enforce the law, if they're not able to redeploy their existing manpower to do the job, and if they need new resources, then of course, as the Bureau Director said, uh, we have a mechanism under which they can make a bid for increased manpower to deal with uh, the policy initiative or whatever. All right, uh, on the um, election, can you tell the REO? Because they've been telling us that um, well, uh, civil servants are not willing to do it, and uh, it's very, uh, they have to work long hours and the pay is not very generous. So you have to get some civil servants uh, to do it. You can't just uh, get uh, anybody from the street to do it. So can you tell us exactly what you can do to help them? All right. We are finished with the first round. We have two in the second round. Um, Li Chia Yan and uh, Kuo Wai Kang. Three minutes. All right. I'd like to follow up um, on the point that I made in the first round. It's, um, well, you said that there was no political no political consideration whatsoever. That cannot be farther from the truth. Well, in fact, uh, as far as the police are concerned, they are going to increase the number by 600. And uh, actually, uh, they will be increasing their establishment from 3, 000, uh, 30,000 to about 40,000, so an increase by some 2.5 percent. Why? What about other departments? Why are they not allowed to do the same? And you said that you've rejected. You, you said that you had rejected uh, the request from some departments. That's not fair. So all the resources would be poured into the police force. 
and if everybody has to reduce their workload, it's not the police force. It's not only the police force which need to reduce their workload. I think all departments would also need that. So I think uh, you're being uh, very unfair to other government departments. So as the main and go saying goes, national security is the most important thing, and therefore, uh, if you look at their budget. Um, much of the resources would go into defense. But then is Hong, has Hong Kong become such a dangerous place that we have to spend so much on the police force? And what about the other departments? You have been grossly unfair to them. So is it that you rejected the request from many other departments? So that's the first thing, first point. Second, as far as civil servants are concerned, what is going to impact them most is that, uh, all right, uh, you're going to uh, uh, force them to uh, reduce their their spending by one percent, but then government departments are very labor intensive, and therefore, if you have to reduce your budget or spending by one percent, then definitely they will have to uh, cut their manpower. If they are not required to cut their manpower, they would already have thought that uh, is a very is very much uh, a boon for them. So it said that um, in the coming years, uh, civil servants' workload will be even greater. Mr. Lee Chuck Yen said that uh, for increase in manpower, well, there are very few departments that have not seen any um, increase in staff establishment. But of course, we have to look at the department's request. And of course, departments are free to raise or put in their bids. But then you also refer to the police force. We understand that uh, basically they have uh, a very large base. And therefore, if you look at the rate of increase, it's, a, it's only about 1.8%. And uh, not many departments. Uh, th in fact, uh, there are quite a few. Of, there are quite a few departments which have um, had a bigger increase. And also for the uh, well, for the um, uh, target of uh, reducing budget uh, spending by uh, zero one zero one one percent. That's because um, to prepare for rainy days, we'd like to exercise more uh, stringent uh, budget control, so that departments are required to. Um, Try and cut their spending by zero, one, and one percent, respectively, in the next uh, few years. Yes, of course, I understand what the FS has in mind, but then you're concerned that uh, in the future there might be structural deficit. Well, that's going to happen in the future. But then now you have already got a structural uh, surplus, and still you're trying to. Uh, pull wool over our eyes by saying that you're going to set up this future fund and all the surplus will go into that fu future fund. And then you are actually trying to stifle the civil service. So are you telling us that under the 011 target, it said that civil service establishment will be the hardest hit? So that number one, there will be no increase whatsoever. And in the end, they may have to cut their establishment in order to achieve the 011 target. Well, um, in simple terms, uh, not necessarily, because uh, when they have to submit their figures or but or uh, accounts, they will have to tell us exactly how they can achieve that target. And uh, not every department would be doing the same. And the most important thing is that, as the FS has explained, well, for the resources that have been saved, that will have to be used um, in introducing new services. So it's not that um, everything will go back to the central government, because if we want to roll out uh, new services and new facilities, then we will have to have new resources. So in simple terms, if a department has got some new initiatives to implement, in fact, they will have to increase their manpower, not reduce. So we are not saying that uh, all the money will have to go back to the central government. In fact, we have to look at uh, how we can make the most effective use of the resources in order to distrib distribute it uh, in a fair manner. Next, uh, Kwa Wai Kang. Thank you, Chairman. The Bureau Director has not answered my second question. That is about um, uh, how um, contract staff can be protected. And also, in the past, well, you always go for the lowest bid when it comes to contracting out. Well, the problem is that you have totally ignored the um, staff's um, remuneration. Because as Mr. Wang Kwok Heng said, well, under the contracting out system, in fact, uh, it's a system of exploitation and it's very unjust uh, and unfair.
So how are you able to ensure that they would be properly protected? Of course, in the long run, they should be absorbed into the permanent establishment. But then for the existing NCSC staff, how are you going to protect them? So how are you, uh, will, will you be conducting another review, for example? Well, there are two points here. First, on contracting out. Individual departments will have to think hard about this. And we, of course, understand your sentiments. But then from the government's perspective, individual departments are trying to provide the services in the most uh, effective manner and in the most uh, cost-effective way. That's why, in some cases, they believe that it's more appropriate to contract out the service. And of course, in doing so, it doesn't mean that uh, after the services have been contracted out, uh, the department will be able to wash its hands off. In fact, in considering whether a service should be contracted out, they would also have to um, consider the performance of the contractor. And if they are not performing well, then obviously that would also affect whether they will be able to get another contract from the department. That's more important than controlling the spending. And of course, uh, the departments will have to ask the contractors to pay their staff uh, reasonably. But then after all, that's the job of the contractor, not directly under the government's responsibility. And as far as we are concerned, through the contracting out system, we have to ensure that uh, because the contractors would also like to continue to become the uh, contractor of the administration. That's why if there are problems involving them, that would also affect whether they'll be able to get another contract. Thank you, Bureau Director. As you said, what is very important is that uh, contracting out a service doesn't mean that uh, the duties and responsibilities would also be contracted out. The administration will have to take up the final or ultimate responsibility. So when it comes to the contracting out of services, can you talk to the director for LCSD so that uh, he'll be able to resolve the labor dispute? Well, I don't have the details with me, but then uh, when I go back, I'll try to find out more from the director, and then I can give you a written reply as to how he's following up on the issue. Next, Li Chuck Yen, third round. Thank you, Chairman. From what I've heard from you, next time you'll be talking about the intermediaries and so on. Well, for um, use of agency workers, I think. Um, it's a very narrow uh, topic. I think we should be talking about uh, the contracting out system. Well, I think the systemic problem is, as Mr. Park White Town just said, does the administration have a responsibility under the system so that uh, it would be looking after the default in uh, payment of wages uh, to all the staff? Because, uh, well, you should not be cheating or shortchanging the workers. It's for you to go after the contractor to make sure that uh, they pay their workers properly. So would the government have this policy in place? That is, will you be held ultimately responsible for all the contractors and also the uh, agencies uh, for their workers' uh, wages? Because you've already got their bonds and also the, uh, uh, the uh, deposit. So what is it used for? Is it just uh, for guaranteeing what is uh, uh, what the government is involved in instead of the staff of these uh, contractors and agencies. So can you broaden the scope of the discussion so that we would be looking at the con uh, contracting out system as well? And also, does the administration itself have this policy requiring all the agencies and uh, the contractors uh, to come up with some family-friendly policies, including allowing their workers to enjoy 17 days of uh, leave instead of 12 days of leave? And also for the paternity leave, of course, we are asking for seven days, and civil servants are now getting five. So would you have policies in place to regulate the uh, contractors? And also the third policy on contractors is that uh, they will have to have an annual pay rise for their workers, because in some cases, uh, the workers are not getting an annual pay rise. So whether it's the agencies or the um, contractors, well, even under the uh, statutory minimum wage system, they would not enjoy this pay rise. And uh, in the end, uh, they would only be getting this uh, pay rise once every two years under the um, SMW system. So will you be requiring the contractors to at least uh, uh, offer their workers an annual pay rise? So these are the questions that I'll be asking at the next uh, meeting. But then I hope that they can answer the questions right now. Bureau Director, I think the most important thing is to um, understand 
the responsibilities. The administration is playing the role of an employer. So when we award the contracts, we have to make sure that the contractors would be acting in a law-abiding manner in, during the course of the contract. And of course, uh, you also said that there should be family-friendly uh, policies. That's already in the law. But then basically, um, the government is not the employer of the workers. It's the contractor or the agency who is the employer of the workers. That's why we should not depart from our uh, role. But then what is your role? All right, you are um, uh, procuring the uh, service. First of all, we are not in favor of uh, the contracting out uh, of services because uh, under that mechanism, the only thing that I can do is to ensure that uh, you would be uh, a proper service procurer instead of uh, an exploiter because uh, for some other companies, when they procure the services, they would be subject to certain regulation. But then. Um, uh, for the administration as a service procurer. Well, in the past, uh, we did have some safeguards, for example, for safe, for security workers or sec for security guards. Uh, in the past, uh, we've been fighting for them to work for only eight hours a day. And in the end, uh, the link rate uh, has not changed its practice. We hope that uh, they would not change it again. So at least uh, in terms of the procurement of service, the administration would, would be subject to some regulations and rules. So as far as the administration is concerned, well, uh, well, you always uh, preach that uh, you'd like to have uh, family-friendly policies, but then as the procurer of services, you would be in a position to do that. And also for statutory minimum wage, as a service procurer, you can require the uh, contractors to increase the pay for their workers once a year. So if you're not able to do that, then you will have to give us an account in the paper. All right, are you just uh, following employment legislation and you think that you are acting very well and uh, you are not putting in place uh, policies that are better off than the uh, employment regulations. If that is the case, then you're actually exploiting the workers. You're not even able or willing to do uh, a better job. Right. I think the administration had heard that. And uh, um, Mr. Chair, I would like to have these questions addressed in the next meeting. Thank you. Uh, we go on to the next agenda item which is the medical and dental benefits for civil servants, pensioners, and eligible dependents. And there are papers for your reference. Now, would the Secretary please bring us through the papers? Uh, well, Mr. Chair, I have a few points to highlight. Um, first of all, just to go back on 2014 and 2015, what we have done in the 2014 and 2015 um, period, there have been 45,000 uh, cases of reimbursement for medical and dental, and it was close to 300 billion Hong Kong dollars, and it was on um, medication and uh, testing and also and a medical equipment. And it was 71 percent, 22 percent, and 5 percent, respectively, of total expenditure. And there was 90 percent of the uh, reimbursement done within the month. And the 2014-2015 had exceeded the commitment for service. And that is within 99 percent was reimbursed within four weeks. As for dental service in 2014 and 2015, there were 11 more dental surgeries uh, opened. And when they were totally commissioned, it would exceed, compared to 2013 to 2014, some increase of 7 percent of service. And for uh, CSEP, uh, oral and uh, and dental clinic in the Northern Territories Hospital, Mer Queen of Mary Hospital, etc. They had been commissioned in 2014, November 3rd, and that had also shortened the waiting time. And now for civil service in Tang Chi Ong uh, formulary, the Department of Health had provided the service and in December 6, 2014, it had commissioned service. 
and the Tanjiong formulary is uh, very centrally located and convenient, and it had been welcome. Now, in 2013 July, the uh, Kowloon City Health Centre had started to house the diagnosis centers from and it's been increased from 6 to 10 and of the diagnosis and centers uh, they had been commissioned in 2013 and for the rest after the medical doctors have been identified and employed they will start the commission and there is another one in Fan Ling and when these 10 clinics are commissioned the civil service clinics will be increased from 32 to 42, and the service provided will have increased by 31 percent. And in the coming years, we will have a number of uh, services. First of all, there will be more for, uh, funds that is by 14 percent to 416 million for reimbursement of medical expenses. And secondly, we will have uh, 17 more dental surgeries added, and the total number of hours of service will be close to 30,000 hours. And the Department of Health, in terms of uh, service hours, had also increased by 8.1 percent compared to 2013. And also, there will be automated telephone booking services uh, commissioned as well. And also, for general outpatients, uh, discs or priority disc distribution, we have started a feasibility study so that for general outpatients where there is more need, we will be able to provide better service there. These are some of the uh, brief highlights, if you will. Yes, five minutes for each. Wong Kwok Heng, Lee Chuck Yen. What can we start with Mr. Wong Kwok Heng first? Uh, Mr. Chair, I have a question for the Secretary concerning Chinese medical service. In fact, there it is. it already enjoys a legal status and the government has a policy of extending Chinese medical service and also to encourage the establishment of Chinese medical clinics and hospitals. However, Chinese medical um, service is still not part of the scheme. Just now, the Secretary mentioned uh, however much funds in terms of reimbursement for medical uh, treatment for the civil service uh, eligible persons. In fact, all these cover but Western medicine and not Chinese medicine. I have raised this time and again, that is, if we only cover or provide Western medicine for the enjoyment of eligible persons under the civil service, then would it amount to discrimination against Chinese medicine? And also, this is inconsistent with the government policy. And as a result, this is unreasonable. So my question for the Secretary is, would the government, as soon as possible, review the provision of Chinese medical service to CSEP so that they can be reimbursed for medical expenses. Yes, Mr. Chair, Mr. Wong had raised this question a number of times. Basically, through the DA, Department of Health and the hospital authority, the services is provided to the civil service eligible persons under the scheme. And Chinese medicine is not practiced under the DH and HA. And also, <clears throat> Uh, and therefore, for the time being, it is very difficult to incorporate Chinese medicine into the scheme. But of course, we are cognizant of the development of Chinese medicine and also in and its role in the uh, public service and uh, in the public uh, or government policy. We will, of course, review this arrangement concerning Chinese medical. Um, service, and we will consider the inclusion of Chinese medicine under the scheme where the 
government or DHOHA operate these uh, medical services. Otherwise, uh, it may actually be a very substantial sum for reimbursement for outside Chinese medical service. We will continue to review the situation. Um, Mr. Chair, I think the Secretary's response is unreasonable because some hospitals already provide Chinese medical services such as Guanghua Hospital and some other hospitals. And also the Department of Health is also promoting such services. The government is also continually extending outpatient medical, Chinese medical service. And there is also a committee for Chinese medicine. How can you say that this is not extended and encouraged? Of course, the government is extending Chinese medical services. If the secretary cannot answer me this question, Mr. Chair, does it mean that we have to invite uh, the DH and HA to the panel for discussions on this topic? Mr. Chair, uh, as I have mentioned for the Kwanghua Hospital, uh, Western medicine and Chinese medicine uh, service, it is not provided by the DH or the HA, but rather by the Kwanghua group of hospitals themselves. So there is a difference. But in the future for Chinese medicine, whether it will become uh, part of the service provided by the HA or the DH, we will have to wait and see. Um, what will you have to wait when when will you have to wait until that is to say where the hospitals under DH and HA run Chinese med medicine uh, services and departments? Well, as I have mentioned, when the DH or HA provides Chinese medical service as a formal uh, service, then we will look into this issue again. Uh, Mr. Chair, can we invite representatives of the DH and HA to discuss this issue with us because there is a wall, it seems, intervening? Right. Uh, we can discuss whether the, the, we can have a specific uh, topic for discussion. Uh, well, when we have a meeting on specifically this topic, we should invite the DH and HA. Um, Mr. Li Yan. well, of course, we would want the DH and HA to provide Chinese medical service. But if the government is saying if they do not provide the service, the government will not take any further action. But now there is a family clinic. There is a civil service clinic. Are you saying that the government has no say in the civil service clinic if the government says the clinic should include uh, Chinese medicine, then they will just invite uh, Chinese medical practitioners to practice in the clinic. In that case, I really have to ask you, what is the nature of civil service uh, clinic? It is exclusive to the use of civil servants, isn't it? And if that is the case, can, why can you not direct the service included or offered in the clinic? It doesn't have to be limited to Chinese medicine. What about chiropractors? Anything that can help civil servants, the civil service improving their health can be included. Now, you also recognize uh, chiropractors and also uh, occupational therapy, um, back pains, etc. I mean, there's a lot to it. As we all know, for office work or even not for office work, there's a lot of uh, wear and tear. And this is the biggest problem facing the modern day worker. I would like to know how much say you have for the civil service medical clinic. Uh, if it is to be limited to Western medicine, then perhaps the civil service itself feels that other medical services are really not medical services outside of Western medical uh, treatment. So how are you going to treat this? Mr. Tang? Well, the DH does not provide Chinese medicine service. And of course, we know that the 
Civil Service Clinic is a frontline uh, clinic where there have to be referrals, then the DH will be referred to, that is, specialists in the DH. Um, Mr. Chair, he's not answered my question. My question was very simple. For the civil service clinics, can they not uh, purchase service? I do not know what relationship you have with the DH, but you are basically the consumer. You pay the money for the service, isn't it? If you pay the money for the service, then the clinic can provide the service. Now, if you have uh, not much work uh, anyway, why don't you take this under your own uh, ambit? The answer is simple. Uh, the DH does not provide Chinese medicine services, but then um, can you make that request. Can you request that? Because this is the family's clinic. It's solely for civil servants. So we'll see if the DFHR is able to do that. And also, it involves a policy decision, and that's for the DFH to provide the medical services. And the um, FH Bureau is, of course, um, looking into the uh, launching of a Chinese medicine hospital. But then when everything is not mature yet, there is no reason why we should incorporate that um, under the medical and health services for the civil servants. And of course, that's not for the Civil Service Bureau to do. We have to have uh, someone with uh, expertise to do it. But then um, as a, a procurer of services, well, if the DFH is not able to do it, if it's so difficult for them, then um, well, obviously, uh, usually I would be strongly against um, contracting out. But then if the DFH is so inflexible, then you should actually, as the saying goes, uh, why don't you just uh, secure the um, uh, health care uh, insurance? If you're not even able to say what kind of medical services you'd like to offer to your civil servants, then uh, what's the purpose of having the Civil Service Bureau in the first place? This is just a minor change. And if you're not even able to do it, then why on earth do we need you? Well, as we all know, in promoting public sector health services. In fact, uh, it's not about our uh, public health care. It's about uh, the uh, services for the civil servants. But then we have to develop it uh, in the public sector before it can be extended to the civil servants. Well, Chairman, well, as we all know, um, the uh, Bureau Director is bound to give us uh, um, his official line. But then um, I think you're mixing it with public sector services, and you are you yourself very confused. As an employer, you can always take the initiative to improve your medical services uh, for your employees, but then you have failed to do it, and you tr you're trying to mix it up with public sector services. I find it most uh, disappointing. All right, I think uh, public servants or civil servants are very concerned about this. But then um, the Bureau Director um, has not been willing to make that promise. Any further questions on this? If not, then I think we have already finished uh, with our business today. And item 5 is uh, any other business. And if there isn't, then I have to um, adjourn the meeting.